Okay, we're ready to rock loose, sorry. I would like to introduce you now to a very good friend of mine. His name is Luis Miguel Falcao. And he is known to all those who know him as simply as Lou. Lou was born a mystic and, and questioned everything from the day he could walk and talk. As a young boy, he often conversed with Jesus and believed, regardless of what others tried to teach him, that there was more to this world than meets the eye. Now, Lou is unique among teachers of the course because Lou is the CEO of a multinational. And I think some wise crack other teacher of A Course in Miracles told him, told him that a CEO cannot become enlightened. Right. So, but anyway, okay, I would strongly disagree with that synopsis. And you better tell us who that was, Michael. So, Lou, basically, <laughs> I preferred you yesterday where you were yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, to all who know Lou, Lou brings the course into the boardroom. That's as simple as that. If there's any disputes in the boardroom, what he simply does, he brings the two uh, warrant factions or the two people in conflict and he invites the Holy Spirit into the boardroom. And the Holy Spirit and Lou's presence and guidance smooths everything over. And I think that's an amazing feat to do in this world because for the next hundred years or so, there's going to be more and more and more CEOs of big companies throughout the world who are going to be basically changing those companies from the inside and changing that direction of the world. And it's my privilege to invite onto the stage now the first guy that I know who's doing this, and there'll be more to follow him. He is an inspiration. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Luis Miguel Falco. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great. First of all, thank you, Michael, for inviting me to Ireland to, to have an opportunity to share remembrances with the rest of self, which is myself reflected back at me today. And what a privilege and an honor it is to be here. And let's thank you for that incredible prayer. And, and to all of you that have met me and have engaged with me over the last few years, thank you for the wisdom and for the teachings that come back at me. And so appreciated yesterday, Leslie, Joey, for you know, sharing lessons again. So appreciate that. And I suppose we all have a unique role to play. And I ask this of you today. No chirps from the audience. Okay, three alarm. And that Whatever I'm challenging you with or presenting here, if it really challenges you and you really disagree, put it on a $50 note and send it to you. you know, send your questions there. I meant to be challenging you. I meant to get you to think. I meant to get you to remember. This is the reason why we're here. We're here to challenge. We're here to remember and to undo the dream. We're here to awaken through love. But these are words that we all use, and it's time that we start to truly live a miracle mindset. And to stop making excuses, and to stop running away, and to stop giving up, and to truly surrender, and then to follow the path. And there is no unique way, there is no perfect teacher, there is nobody in form. There is no one in form without ego. There is no one in form without persona. The minute anyone stands in front of you and says, I am healed, I am perfectly awakened, they are back into persona. Never look at the teacher on the stage and think that person gets it. I go through more dark nights than most of you. I think teachers up front here are more stubborn learners than the rest of us. I think we're more complex, and the complexity of our ego is of such a nature that we require a stage in order to have more reflections back at us. Never put us on a pedestal. Never idolize us. The minute you do that, you stand the greatest chance of losing 
your battle of remembrance because if we fail in your eyes, we fail you. You have to follow your nature. And that is what my talk is about. You will wake up. It is not an option. Each one of us is part of the puzzle. Every single one of you is unique. Your greatest difference from one another, your greatest difference from each other, is your greatest gift to one another. What makes you different is the gift to the collective mind. Once upon a time, you used that difference to serve the power of God, to prove to God that you were more powerful. When handed over to the Holy Spirit, that uniqueness becomes a unique part of the puzzle that returns us all as one hope. Do not fight your nature. Do not discount yourself. There is a reason why you were designed in that exact way that you're designed. The brain you have, the body you have, the sex that you have. And when you start to understand how it works, you start to awaken. What is enlightenment but the return back home? What is enlightenment but a decision? What is God but a decision? And Nick, what is love but a decision? Thank you for that yes. And so, the only way we remember is going within. Even the Bible speaks of it. Unless you go within, you go without. What does that truly mean? Where is within? I mean, they say in South Africa or Portuguese, uh, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, because that's what we're talking about. Go within. Ultimately, our nature, your unique nature, is your clue to the perfect path for you to return. The minute you try and follow someone else's path as a way back home, you put yourself in line for total favor. There's only one path for you, and that is uniquely your own through your own nature. Every teacher, everyone you meet is a potential clue that enlightens the next step. The Michaels of this world are radical, radical teachers. The Ken Wapniks of the world came in to build the foundation. They were the fundamental teachers. They came in and established the fundamentals of A Course in Miracles. And the minute you stay there, you stay stuck. You're meant to explore. You're meant to challenge. To say that you're not meant to challenge <coughs> Ken's initial teachings, or the way that he taught, his perspective on A Course, you're stuck. Every teacher is going to bring you a completely different and unique perspective. Another clue. Don't get stuck on any of them. And certainly do not get stuck on mine. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of story. We all start here. We all start with these fundamental questions. <clears throat> what are we? Who are we? Why are we here? Why is this such a vengeful place? Why, why do animals have to die for us to eat? Why do animals kill each other in order to live? You know, to live? Why does it seem to that someone needs something, someone loses something? Why is this earth an earth of duality? What is God? Where are we? And of course the question, where do we go when we die? These are questions we all start with. Who asked those questions once, once upon a time? Give us, give us a hand. Who's still asking us questions? I mean, who gets confronted with, you know, psychic phenomena, mediumship? Is it necessary? Who's a medium? In this audience, come on, raise your hands. Who's the mediums here? Who's the largest? Who's the smallest? I'm a medium. Not quite very tall. It's very difficult for us to in life reach the light bulb. Only tall ones do that. It's funny. Okay, so, I'll tell you a little story about myself. Don't get hung up on the story. You know, in essence, I was born with memory. I was born with the ability to remember what appeared to be multiple lifetimes. As a young boy living in Mozambique, I used to make pocket money by telling women that they were pregnant and whether it's going to be a boy and a girl. And of course, it was that accurate that they kept coming up. And I was making a lot of money. I bought my first bicycle through mediumship. Mediumship became a financial success story for me. Interesting, isn't it? And even though you couldn't understand it, nobody understood it. When they were pregnant, they didn't know. Straight afterwards, they thought, well, it must have been a look. It must have been a guess. Well, if you're never wrong, it can't be a guess. Something 
happened that allowed me to remember. I now understand what it is, but as a young child I didn't. The fact that I remembered being people in different lifetimes in total detail scared everyone. And it scared me as a child because I started to realize not everybody else could remember. What also scared me was the fact that I realized not everybody has the ability to see and converse with this being or beings that I see. And many years later, having studied psychology, I started to figure out that I wasn't, after all, schizophrenic, multiple personality disorder. That what was happening to me was something unexplainable, but very real, because the messages that they gave were incredibly accurate. However, I started to believe that I was special. Not particularly very tall or short, not particularly very good looking or sexy, but most definitely special. Because I had this special gift, I must have been chosen. I couldn't understand what was going on, I didn't understand how it worked, but it was pretty cool. Standing on a stage, being able to give messages from past loved ones on, it was pretty, pretty cool. And of course, the duality of what I lived, I lived a dualistic life because on the one side I worked in the corporate world, on the other side I was doing this, these once a week shows, they were shows, and I'm a bit of a showman, so I can entertain audiences, I can charm, and be sexy. Um, what didn't make any sense is the cruelty that I observed in the world. At 33, a blessing came along and I was diagnosed with the birth of a cystic brain tumor and given three months to live. It was the most blessed experience of my life because it was the beginning of my surrender. Fully surrendering to knowing that you're going to die. It's just a couple of months away. It's a very sobering experience. It really makes you turn inwards. It makes you ask some of the most important questions of your life. I clinically died. I was dead for 26 minutes. Now imagine this in South Africa. Because now you've come back from the dead. <laughs> you know? And the craziest experience of that was I came back and it felt like I'd been away for 20 years because I have the most detailed memory of another world where it's really, really cool. It's really peaceful really relaxing, this beautiful music in the background, which after 20 years just becomes annoying. Angels become annoying. <laughs> Happiness becomes annoying. You know, this, this oneness becomes annoying. And I really wanted to get away from that. I wanted to get away from happy. Because you know. And when I awoke, sort of part of your work in this world. My brain had moved into hyperdrive. The next couple of years I read over 1,500 books. I can retain all that information. I had all that information in my head. I can recall and recite all of it. It's quite believable. What I don't have is the mathematical ability I once used to have. I now need a calculator. One plus one is 11. I'm convinced. <laughs> and the abilities I once had as a businessman disappeared. I have no recollection of studying architecture, of doing a BCom degree, of doing my MBA. I have no recollection of doing that. I have, however, the ability to still do whatever I know. And what I found amazing in spirit form, and the memory I have of spirit form, is the minute I asked a question, the answer would be instant. You all read or heard about the near-death experiences when you travel down the tunnel. It's floaty, floaty feeling and, and beings appear that are still on this earth, but they're on that plane too. And it's quite scary because you, you're aware that, that you're sort of dead and people come to greet you that are supposedly still alive. And the first thought I had was Jesus. <coughs> the first thought I had was Jesus. And instantly, this being that looked what I imagined Jesus to look like appeared. And I asked the question, are you? Yes. 
Were you crucified? Yes. Did you physically die? Yes. Why did you have to suffer? I did not suffer. And you can't be Jesus. Jesus died on the cross and suffered for three days. I did not suffer. That disturbed me. That answer disturbed me. Much later on, after doing 3,000 past life regressions and, and spirit world regressions, life between life regressions, where 3,000 clients with a variety of belief systems attested to the exact same experience I had remembered in my death experience. To the exact detail, names and places. Nine different types of angels, each with a very different function. Soul group clusters, soulmate structures. Incarnation processes, reasons for incarnation. Lessons, classroom sessions that we have on the other side. In total detail, in exactly the same way. The Hall of Records. Why such a place exists. What the purpose of that is. Everybody attesting to it in exactly the same way. I was convinced that was heaven and it bothered me because it was an annoying place after 20 years. <laughs> there is nothing more annoying than happy, happy, happy angels. <coughs> you know why? Because I still wasn't at peace. Not because the angels were happy. Because something inside me was not at peace. Something inside me hadn't realized what was going on. Something was still disturbing me. That is the reason why I reawoke re in form again. I had to bring this information back. And I had to bring it back in a logical way because esoteric people are just like, wow, it's cool, smoke something and be happy, right? No one takes it seriously. You don't want to prove anything, you're just happy. You move it to Finhorn, move it to a caravan, it's pretty cool. It's a nice place, it's a wonderful place. Then you're retiring. But the world doesn't take it seriously, and the massive world, the masses world, the world of business and economics certainly doesn't pay any attention. Why would they? They're busy looking at the next return on investment and how we make money or how we go to war if we don't make money so that we can generate money. The rest of the world is not interested in this. And so when an esoteric person speaks, it's either conspiracy theory or just, you know, he's smoking something. But when a businessman speaks with an MBA and a BCom and a PhD and a double doctorate and a blah, 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 and he's turning companies around and he understands return on investment and he understands how to invest and how to make money and how to get rich. The world stands up and pays attention because if he can do it, then surely we can too. What makes him so special? You know, is it just law of attraction? Has he read the secret? You know, are we just attracting parking spots and shorter queues and money? Why does law of attraction still work? Has anyone asked the question, why is law of attraction still working? Why are we still making manifest, at will, our material desires? How does that work? Has anybody asked the question? Are you asking the question? You need to ask the question. And who's manifesting? What I love about Michael's teachings is that he really brings the awareness of what we're doing into consciousness. If you don't understand how the ego works and how the persona works, you will be trapped. We need to understand this. Wapnik wasn't ready for that. Wapnik was back to building a foundation. It was important that he did that. It's important that we move on and we take it to the next level. Or else we become no different to any fundamental religion that it's, as a base was purely pure and, and beautiful and, and came out of love. And because we didn't challenge, we shoehorn everybody into that way, that dogma. And centuries later, it is nothing but a dogmatic tyrant. Trying to hold everybody into a path that was good 2,000 years ago. The purpose of the course was to set and establish a foundation whereby each and every unique individual here can find a way back home. And out of my total frustration after all this regression work, I was still unhappy because in this world of duality, something had to die in order for something else to thrive. 
that bothered me. And I stared up at the sky and asked God, what the hell were you doing? What were you thinking when you created this? I fell asleep that evening and I had a dream. And in my dream I heard a voice say, I did not create this mess, you did. <laughs> and it was an absurd notion. What do you mean I did? I didn't create the universe. I didn't create the planets, the stars, the solar system. I didn't create planet Earth. How can I? I'm just human. My little miss get dead. I'm humble. There's no way I could do this. And I fell asleep again and the, the voice again said, I did not create this mess, you did. That weekend I went away, took a, a group on a retreat, arrived back home, and there was this appearance of the universe in my postbox. Sort of a border course of miracles. And then I experienced some incredible revelation. I experienced my true first vision of God, not these psychic visions of predictions, but my true first vision, my first experience of the mind of God, my first holy instant. And 30 days of revelation followed, where I read the entire book in 30 days, and I know it sounds inconceivable, almost impossible. For 30 days I read that entire book, and I absorbed that book, it became me. And from that day onwards, I could no longer stand on a stage and do mediumship and crossing over the blue. And I was <coughs> completely derailed. Completely derailed. Because as I got into A Course in Miracles, the first thing I did is I went on to YouTube and started downloading, met Nick on YouTube, met Michael on YouTube. And started downloading everything I could, trying to understand. A couple of months later, I get invited to speak in the UK, meet these incredible course teachers. I was very derailed by some of them. Because I had all this other information, and it was, I was, it was led on that I really shouldn't be teaching any of that. It's, it's, it's not real, let it go. You know, the body isn't real, it's all ego. I just got to be quiet somewhere, sit on a rock, be quiet. And so I stopped teaching for a while. I just put all this away, stopped teaching. But thank God for Michael Murray's. Every now and again, he challenged me, and I was invited to be the last year, as I was about to give up teaching. But I'd given my word I'd come, so I went. Begrudgingly, I didn't want to go, I didn't want to teach anybody. I wanted to be quiet, I wanted to sit quietly and not say another word. But I came to Ireland just before that and then went up to Finland where I realized that's where I'm going to retire. And, and something clicked in my conversations with Michael, in my conversations with Nick and Carolina and Steve and the Dutchman, the flying Dutchman, <laughs> reminded me of something and, and I'm going to share that with you. When I surrendered to my present situation, knowing in total faithfulness that I am always exactly where I'm meant to be, that's for each and every single one of us, that all things are lessons God would have me learn. And learning in this world is actually just remembering. True learning is remembrance. When you learn a skill in this world, you're not remembering anything. You're just adding to the delusion of the persona or the ego. I have a function God would have me full. And so I place my future path in the hands of God. And I know this for a fact, we are finding our way back home. Awakening back in God, the atonement is not an option. Every single one of you is waking up. If you have to ask the question, You've missed something very, very important. The fact that you've asked the question means you're awakening. The minute you ask the question, you started to awaken. And the only way that we can do this in true faith, and at all times secure, in the knowing that the ego is not going to corrupt you, is to walk in the way of gratitude. Unless you're practicing gratitude, you will stray. This I know. 
I take full responsibility for the dream of darkness. I take full responsibility for the dream of darkness. Can you say that? Or did someone else do it? And you're just an unwilling pawn in the game of darkness. Can you truly say, I take full responsibility for creating this dream? I'm totally, totally accountable. <coughs> I'm totally accountable for forgetting who I am. No one else to blame. I take full ownership of our collective remembrance. I'm not leaving it up to Carolina. I'm not leaving it up to you. Nick, I'm not leaving it up to you. Steve, I'm not leaving it up to you to save me. Michael, I'm not leaving it up to you to save me. JP, I'm not leaving it up to you to say. Leslie, I'm leaving it up to you to help. <laughs> I share with myself what I remember. It's a moral obligation to myself. I'm programmed this way. It's natural for me to be up here. It doesn't take a lot of effort for me to be up here. You could ask me to speak about anything for the next two days. I would be able to get up here and speak for the next two days. It's effortless for me. I could be exhausted. I've just traveled halfway across the world. When I'm up here and spirits flowing through me, this is beautiful. This is when I have the least ego. This is when I am mostly connected. This is when I am mostly in love with all, at peace with everything. I am now in my most natural state. Standing up here is natural for me. Show me a sign of hands who would hate the idea of standing up here. Don't try. You're not designed that way. Show me your hands who'd love to be up here. Well then do it. Because then you're designed to be there. You're designed to do that. You're part of the puzzle that does this. I know for a fact, this is what happened. And Ken was very anxious explaining how the dream came about. I watched countless of his programs when he was asked a question, he would not answer it. And quite frankly, you should not be answering or trying to figure out the puzzle with the very same device that created the puzzle. But I was given a certain gift, I was given a certain nature. The inquiring left and right brain. I need data in order to sense. I need to understand in order to make sense of something. That is the way I program. That is the way I program myself in order to prove to God I was more powerful than He was. When I surrendered this and offered it back to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit used this in order to bring me back and those that are interested as signposts for your awakening. How do we fall asleep? We simply ask a most innocent question. The Holy Son of God asked a most simple, innocent question. What would it be like if it wasn't always bliss? So, for want of a better diagram, I'm now drawing infinite bliss as a white circle. So just bear with me, I'm now, that circle represents infinity. The circle up on the screen represents God. Infinite, blissful, eternal light. It goes on forever and ever. If you look very closely, it's made up of billions of little cells of light. It's infinite, it's beautiful, it's divine, it's love. And inside this blissful, eternal, infinite, loving light are millions of little, billions of little cells of light. Every particle like every other particle. There is no difference between one particle of light and every other particle of light. Every single cell in God is identical. Fully conscious, fully present, omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient. Infinite, divine love. 
That is all that exists, everything like itself. A single cell in God, a single cell in God asks a simple, innocent question. What would it be like if it wasn't always this? That was the question that started the fall. That is the question that started the falling asleep. And what happened was, due to free will, the I that asked the question simply dreamt of nothing. What is the opposite of love? What is all encompassing can have no opposite. Nothing is the opposite of love. However, what is the opposite of fear, or the opposite of hate, or the opposite of darkness? Love. But love has no opposite. What is all encompassing has no opposite. Infinite, blissful, loving life has no opposite. So as the single son asked the question, what would it be like if it wasn't always bliss, if it wasn't always this, it simply dreams of nothing. It dreams of darkness. And we don't know how long it takes. It takes an instant. Or maybe what appears to be billions of years. After dreaming of nothing for a long time, we simply ask for help. We ask for help. I ask for help. I dream of nothing. I'm aware of nothing. It's dark. I was once in light. I was once filled with unconditional loving light. And now I ask to see the experience of what it's like not to have that. And what do I experience? I experience nothing. I experience nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I become afraid. So I ask for help. And in my dream of darkness, I see this tiny little bulb of pure white light. This tiny little sparkle of light enters the dream of darkness. So I ask to experience what it's like. It wasn't always bliss. Darkness. The minute I ask for help, I see light. Because I'm still in God. I've never left God. I'm just dreaming in God that I'm not there. I'm dreaming of nothing. And so the minute I ask for help, God calls back to me. Return, wake up. And what I experience that light in my dream is simply a little dot of light. And as I focus on the light, that's what experiences. That's what we experience. And that's what scientists call the Big Bang. There's an explosion of light, there's an infusion of light into the dream. All of a sudden, I become aware of space as light enters the dream. We call it the explosion, we call it the stars that are now born into this dream of darkness. I become aware of space, I become aware of self as energy form. And this is how the universe is born. The universe is a representation of what happens in the dream of darkness. Does it make sense? But what actually happens in the step of in, this, in the variety of steps of fall, and I'm explaining this to get to a very valid point. Don't pay too much attention if you're not too mathematical. I'll explain the formulation of fall. This was repeated to me several times in my regression work. As I fell asleep. The I am is born, the singular I. In the very first split of darkness and light, the I splits into two. It splits from it splits the masculine and the feminine. As told in the story of Adam and Eve, he falls asleep, God takes his rib, Eve is born, for the rest of his life he spends chasing after her. It's the masculine and the feminine split. That's the symbolism of the Adam and Eve story. So all of a sudden there's a duality, there's two, light and darkness, right and wrong, male and female, 
Duality is born into the dream. And there's a reason why duality is born in the dream. Without duality, we're not aware of self. Remember, we've asked the question, we've asked to know what it's like if it wasn't always bliss. So we're now experiencing what it's like if it wasn't always bliss. At any given moment, if we have asked for remembrance, we would have received remembrance. But we cannot remember that we were once in infinite bliss. We asked to remember what it was like if we were always in dark, you know, if it wasn't always light. We wanted to experience the opposite. Innocently, this was not a vengeful dream. We didn't do this in vengeance. We did this simply out of an innocent question. There's no ego yet. There's simply the awareness. It's what Michael speaks of at, at the next level. He's speaking of the next level already. This is where we come from. The next level is where we come from. We've just stepped down the levels. We've got to return back the same path we, we came from. So in duality, in the first separation of male female, we become aware of another self. The conversation begins. Light and dark, the space begins. In realizing that we're no further from the truth, having split ourselves into two, we do the split again. But to split the cell into another two didn't give us the answer the first time around. So we try it three times. Two plus two plus two. Six masculine, six feminine. We now have the 12. In every ancient teaching, the 12 appear. In every ancient teaching, the 12 are always the 12 sacred names. The 12 sacred symbols. The 12 disciples. The 12 apostles. There's 12 in every. And before the first 12, when we go back into spiritual regression, those 12, the council of elders, there's 12 of them of those that help us with predestiny and setting up our future incarnations in order to remember. Those 12 are still there. And if you go to the Kabbalistic teachings, the 12 names are there. And if you go to later teachings, those 12 names become the names of the archangels. So, go into Kabbalistic Tree of Life, the 12 archangel names are the 12 sets of consciousness. The minute you mystify it, it becomes magical. And then you paint pretty pictures with wings and angels. Angels don't need wings, and they certainly don't need feathers. They travel as thought form. But everybody would love to fall in love, love, in love with an angel, wouldn't we? It's just magical. It sets us fully for what we are, just love us, play harp music, and, you know, ride bicycles with us in Central Park. It's just so magical. Just love us. Only love us. No one else. Angel only loves me. We have this special relationship with the angel. After the twelve realize that they're no further from truth, and the Course teaches us clearly that you cannot solve the problem with the mind that created it. We didn't figure that out yet. So what we do is we replicate again. And each twelve repl replicates three times. Twelve times twelve times twelve. When all twelve have replicated, there's 1.728 million of them. And so the replication continues. And we have several falls. Don't get too caught up on the numbers. And as they fall, they discover different dimensions. The next fall, they discover the random chance of the universe. Because the first time they split into two, it's pretty random. Two times two times two. It's less random. Why did they not just replicate twice again? And so we get into chance, we move into chance. Chance brings about the opportunity and the possibility of fear. And the minute the possibility of fear appears in the dream of darkness, the ego appears. For the first time, fear enters into the dream. At first we were just playing with energy. At first we were just playing with <coughs> shapes and forms. And now we have the possibility that something can go wrong. And the minute we have the possibility that something can go wrong, that I'm not in control of my destiny, I'm not in control of fate, fear enters the dream, the ego enters the dream, and at the next point of replication, we start to understand time. Where once upon a time, there was just two of us, we're right there in proximity, then there's 12, then there's 1,728, then there's 5 billion, now there's a gazillion, 
and so forth and so forth, and time starts to come into the dream. And as chance comes into the dream, we start to realize space, time, and scarcity. We realize we're running out of energy, and in order for me to do something more, I need energy, so I take energy from you. As I take energy from you, I get re-energized. As I get re-energized, I can do more. And so the concept of scarcity, fear, space, and time creeps deeper and deeper into the dream. And eventually, we start to realize there's a cause and effect that takes place in the dream. Law of attraction is still there. Those of us that figure it out, keep and start our little secret societies, we only share it amongst our small little clans. We realize that we have the power, we can control those around us. We move further and further into separation. We get further and further lost in space and time. And it was all so innocent at first. At first, we simply asked the question, what did it be if it wasn't always bliss? And now we're trapped in this shit. Now we're trapped in this nightmare where nothing works. No matter what I buy after a couple of years, it no longer works. Remember buying that new car a couple of years back and it smelled so good and it drove so well, and today it's a crock. Today it's a ball of rubbish, you can't wait to get rid of it. But you can't afford the next one. Why can't it just be perfect like it was the day I bought it? He marries her hoping she'll never change. She marries him knowing she starts changing him from the minute he's there. <laughs> what is that? It's because we fear cause and effect, we try and control everything. How much is spent every year on cosmetics, on health products, on getting slim, on looking good, on feeling better? The world is, is consumed by cause and effect. The reason the world loves the secret, so we can figure out how to make our next million and be popular, be famous. We don't, we're not interested in the essence of what we are, so that we can remember. We're interested in the essence of what we are, so we can be remembered. We're so deep into our own poo, that there's almost no way of getting out of it. And there's definitely no way of getting out of it on our own. We're stuck. In the beginning of the dream, it was beautiful, it was just Formless thoughts split off from the original I, the God, the small G God of old. And you can see how that God, that I am, sort of crept into mythology as the, the creator of the universe and everything in it. This vengeful creator. Because even the ancients realized that this God that created everything is still quite a vengeful bugger. The devil is a woman, most definitely. Um, only a woman holds a grudge for 2,000 years. It has to be a woman. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so we just wanted to remember. So we, we kept replicating. We kept playing with energy. We kept playing with forms until we made man. It was just fun in the beginning, a dance of joy. And we're still doing it. Part of ourselves is still replicating. We make solar systems, stars, planets. We make creatures. And every time we make something we don't like, we just destroy it. We find a way to get rid of it. We didn't like dinosaurs. As wretched little buggers, you couldn't train them, you couldn't get them to sit, play a fetch. <laughs> just this little bugger. And they would eat you at any opportunity. So, you know, we just got rid of them. One big stone and a couple of thousand miles per second, and then we just wiped out the earth, wiped out the dog, and start again. And none of you remember this, do you? And we chose to forget. Because it was such a fearful dream, we chose to forget. We chose the experience of spirit progression. We chose to not remember. The biggest challenge for us is we realize no matter what we make, it ceases to exist after a while. Things get old, things die, we go bald, we go slow, things hurt that never hurt before. You know, getting up isn't that easy. And it makes us fear. The minute the ego enters the mind, we start to fear. And we don't want to face our reality because that means that we have to own up to the fact that I am responsible for this mess. I am responsible for the mess my life is in. 
I'm responsible for the state of mind I'm in. I'm responsible for all those miserable people in my life that make my life so bloody miserable. Of course, that's not me. I, I'm perfect. I don't have any miserable people in my life. If I do, I just fire them. You know? Because matter disintegrates, we start to fear God. We start to think that if God is like us, since we're made in some sort of nature that must truly be like God, then perhaps God is going to disintegrate me. And let me ask you now this very, very important question. What if the next time you close your eyes, you die? No one will ever remember you, and you will never remember having existed. Who's ready for that? No one will ever remember you existed. No one will ever write about you. And you will never remember having existed in four. Who's ready for that? No one? That's why you're still here. Because if you were to wake up as the Holy Son of God, in God, fully awake, fully in love, fully in bliss, you would not remember having had this dream. And until you prepare to not remember having existed in form, you will return. Because you've invested in form. It's scary, isn't it? It's just my take on it. I could be wrong. <laughs> but think about that for a second. Why do you want to remember having suffered? Why do you want to remember having fallen asleep? Why don't you just want to remember being in God, being in bliss, being in infinite divine love? Why do you want to remember all your human experiences through time? What has that helped you? How is that going to help you? How is recording this current lifetime, or anyone before that, regardless of how sexy or powerful you were in that life, going to help you remembering the unconditional divine bliss and love of God? Why would you want to remember having fallen asleep? Surely there must be a better way than this. Wouldn't you rather just know that you're loved? Do you really want to remember having been physical? Do you really want to remember having suffered? We've been trying to remember for eons. We've left ourselves clues over and over again. In ancient symbology, in the flower of life, in the ancient pyramids, we've left clues behind as to what we are. Many of us have figured out the answer. We've been figuring out the answer for years. And the minute you figure out, someone chops off your head because you're a witch. <laughs> or, you know, you're, you're, you're a cult. And so, as soon as you remember, you leave clues behind very suddenly realizing other people remember. I mean, 20 years ago, they would have killed Michael Frank and said, off of this. Right? It's a lot out of the woods. A hundred years ago, they would have killed him and his entire family for him having said that. And all of us included, because we're in the room with him, just by association. So, as we awaken, as we lighten up, we get in a way with more and more remembrance. The world is becoming more and more ready. The world is already a better place. I love those people that are stuck in time and they love classical old stuff, you know, like classical music and classical cars, you know, that you have to wind to start. And <laughs> classical stuff. And people that love classical stuff are really stuck in the past. I love classical cars, but that's another story. <laughs> I'm not stuck in the past. I'm fully present right now. Just in case you're wondering, a couple of hours from now may not be, but in the past we left clues. God's language of what we are is hidden in everything. It's in antiquity. We've left it in the building blocks of the human body, in time, in PHI, 0.618, in, in the makeup of the human body, are the clues as to why we're here, how law of attraction works what God is. We've been leaving clues behind. I've gone into this in total detail. 
I've studied the building blocks of DNA. I've gone into quantum physics, quantum science, quantum dynamics, quantum thermodynamics. The answer was always the same. The answer was always the same. It kept pointing back to the same thing, 0.618. The soul of the the me, the frequencies of the cross, the frequencies of the star of David. It's in the building blocks of our universe. We leave it behind as crop circles. Our brothers, our lighter brothers, travel through and leave crop circles behind in exactly the same shape. We're leaving the clues behind for ourselves all the time. The answer still gets us absolutely nowhere. There is no answer with the mind that created the dream. The mind that created the dream cannot find a way out. Whether we combine the masculine and the feminine, or bring in the feminine God, or heighten the masculine God, or bring the two in and soil them and focus on pink lights and listen to happy spiritual music and stop eating meat and meditate all day long and face east and do the mantras, you're not going to figure it out. You start to touch on it when you go quiet. It's the only time you get close to it. But your ego mind kicks back in and you can't stay quiet for too long. Unfortunately, the mind pulls you straight back out. The answer is actually truly only in the silence. The mind awakens little bit by little bit. And as each one awakens, it contributes to the collective whole. Each one of you is awakening. And each one of you is contributing to the I awakening. Don't ever discount that. With every thought you have in God, the only thoughts you have are with God. The only true love you have is the love that you have with God, in God. Human love is not love, it's lust. It's attraction, it's desire, it's fun. It's not real. The only real love you have is the love you have unconditionally in with God. Attraction is required in order for learning to happen. Soul knows what you need. It will attract you to the person that is going to drive you absolutely fucking insane in order for you to learn. Opposites attract for a reason because that's how you learn. We're stubborn. We don't learn peacefully. We don't learn gently. It takes a few knocks to the head. We need to stumble. We need to fall. We need to have the dark nights in order to awaken. The greatest gift you have in your life is when things turn to shit. So that you can find a way out of it and as you learn in your way out, you remember and you contribute to the eye. 2,000 years ago, one of us figured it out. And that one we know as Jesus. He even failed in his attempts as the consciousness in Buddha. He even failed in his consciousness as Christian. So very close. But as the man, Jesus, he got it. He figured it out. And he came to demonstrate the ability of ascension, of awakening, not resurrection, ascension. That was the ultimate gift. He came to show us that we can all contribute. He came to show us the power of awakened mind. And the minute he awoke, he no longer could be informed because he imparted that collective knowledge to the collective mind. That is why he's in all minds, all little minds have access to the collective Christ. As Jesus woke up into it, he imparted it on all of us. Those that are ready to listen, those that are ready to receive, ask, it is yours. The Holy Spirit entered the dream of darkness the minute we asked for help. Light entered the dream. And we have help in a variety of forms. We have each other. And no matter, the sooner you figure something out, fear will take over. The minute you figure something out, you have these moments of total bliss, total joy. You'll leave this conference on a high. And three days from now, a week from now, the ego kicks back in and says, what if? What if Michael was wrong? What if Lewis was wrong? What if Steve was wrong? What if Nick was wrong? What if Caroline was wrong? 
and it tries to find controversy, it tries to make you doubt. The minute you start to figure out, ego is an active attack thought system that doesn't want you to awake. It wants you to remain asleep. It wants you to identify with the, with the ego, with the persona. It wants you to be trapped between the two. It wants you to fail conversation with yourself. It wants you to stay asleep. It doesn't want you to wake up. And yet, we've been given a guide. And besides each other, we have a course in America. And you could do this course on your own. You could sit on a rock, in a cave, away from everybody, and just study the course. Go into silence, the answers are there. But we didn't come into form alone. And therefore we will not return out of form alone. Every single aspect of the self, every single one of us, has to awaken in order for the dream to end. It's not that some of us will awaken and the rest of us will just disappear into the collective ooze of poo and just pull feather on God. And some of us are special and we awaken and the rest will stay behind. Every single one of us is part of the collective eye. Every single one of us has to wake up in order for the dream to end. It's not that you move into Christ consciousness and it's beautiful angel music and harp and, and violins and it's wonderful and the rest remain asleep. Who's got kids? Raise your hands. Who's got pets, doggies and cats? If your kids, doggies and cats are trapped in a burning building and there's no one else around to help, will you just stand and watch? Or would you do something about it? Would you return into the building to fetch them? Who would? Who would do it? That's why you keep returning into four. That's why you keep returning into form. And it's not a bad thing. You keep returning into form because you want to help the rest of yourself out that burning building. You keep returning into form because the rest of you is not awake yet. And with each remembrance, with each lesson that you remember, with each bit of love that you remember more and more of what you are, the collective whole wakes up. So I ask you to say the following with me. These are lessons 190. I choose the joy of God instead of pain. I am a holy son of God. I have a function God will have me for. Do that again. Come on. Don't forget that. Okay? All things are lessons God would have me learn. All things. So what you call shit and what you call happy. All of it are lessons God would have you learn. There's a lesson in everything. There's a lesson in everyone. Okay, I place the future in the hands of God. Love is the way I walk in gratitude. There is no peace but the peace of God. There is no peace but the peace of God. So seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Go to peace first. Forget about the rest. Seek the kingdom. Try to remember. That is your first and primary purpose. And here's my little formula. I share this around the world. You have a vision. The vision is simple. A happy dream. You have a mission on this earth. And that is to totally remember that you're a holy son of God. That is your mission. That is why you're here. You're not here to be successful or rich or famous or to have a family and find the perfect partner and have a house and a picket fence and four kids and two dogs and four cars and a holiday home. You're here to remember. Whatever you have around you is there to help you remember. Your purpose is atonement. There's only one purpose. Your purpose is atonement. Everybody has the same purpose because our purpose was at first to not remember. Your function is complete and total forgiveness. That is all you're meant to be doing. That's the only thing you're really doing. The rest is filling in the gaps, pretending to be something you're not, pretending to do something you're not. Okay, and then you can have goals. And for example, I share some of mine, overcome the obstacles to peace. 
to live a happy dream with no judgment, to overcome idols, people, places, things, and events. And I think I don't have idols, and what I do, I buy another motorcycle. I, I try and avoid special relationship with another person, and then I have a, a special relationship with my company, or I have a special relationship with a toy I buy. And it's to overcome special relationship. The only true relationship I should have is with the Holy Spirit, with God. And so, here's a little one that you can take away with you. Lessons. The more lessons we remember, the less sons there will be. The less little identities. And then the less sons there will be, eventually we'll get to the one son. And we'll awaken in God. And that is it. I hope I've shared something with you.